Will the Falcons being punished for tampering actually help them in the long run? You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, everyone, to another illustrious episode of the Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 with any winning $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. So, guys, if you don't know me, I'm your humble host, Aaron Freeman. Been covering the Falcons since 2006, formerly at falcfans.com. RIP, still going strong on this illustrious podcast. You may also know me as Sirius Black, as Mr. Drew, as the Jolly Green Giant, as the Iron That Sharpens the Iron, as Mr. Paycheck, as Mr. AKA, all of the above. And of course, I thank each and every one of you that is an everydayer of this podcast that makes it your first listen or first watch each and every day and all you got to do to become an everyday or subscribe or follow for free on youtube or wherever you listen to podcasts so today's episode we will be talking about you know the bets that the falcons are making on the offensive side of the ball and defensive side of the ball talking about you know zach robinson as the big bet they're making on offense talking about some of these young defensive players stepping up uh, on the defensive side of the ball we'll get into deeper on arnold ebiketti and if he's poised for this breakout year in this double digit sack season that I think a lot of folks are expecting him to have but we'll start off talking about the news that I should have discussed yesterday but guys I was it's still in vacation mode coming back from Orlando and I, I missed this news so we'll talk about it today and that is of course that we might get a resolution to the tampering uh alleged tampering that the Falcons may or may not have conducted uh, in regard to signing Kirk Cousins earlier this offseason, according to ESPN's Adam Schefter. You know, we had that report the week before the draft that, oh, it may come this week. It didn't. So now we're getting another report saying it's likely to come this week. And it's like, OK, well, hopefully it does. Um, you know, the various reports of the Falcons punishment will be more severe. Is that relative to past tampering punishments or is that just relative to what the Eagles, another team that is being investigated for tampering in regards to them signing Saquon Barkley this all season, uh, are getting. So as I said, in March and April, when the, this topic, you know, reared its ugly head, so to speak, then is when we find out information, we'll talk about the information, but until then, it's like all we can really do is like speculate. And it's hard to kind of speculate because there's only really been two times in at least the last decade. And I, I don't know if there's been instances before that where teams have been punished for tampering. Uh, and so there, you don't have this sort of strong precedent of being like, oh, you know, like in the case of gambling where you know, the NFL's gambling penalties go back like 50 years. And it's like, oh, if you get caught gambling, you go away for a year. So like, you know, it was easy to speculate about what was going to happen with like Calvin Ridley and and whoever else got hit with those uh, penalties. Not the case with the tampering stuff. And, you know, the one of those punishments was the Kansas City Chiefs back in 2016, 2017, when they were fined heavily and were stripped of a third round pick in 2016 and, 20, and a sixth round pick in 2017 for their tampering with Jeremy Macklin in the 2015 uh, offseason. And my expectations is that's what the punishment will be, something along those regards, because that's probably the best precedent we have here. Um, but it, it could be more severe than that. It could be less severe than that, right? And what I've said consistently throughout this offseason is over the 20 or so years that Roger Goodell has been NFL commissioner, very few people, if, if not nobody, has ever really walked away from any of the NFL's punishments, whether they've been suspensions, fines, and whatnot, feeling like, oh, well, we were that was a fair punishment. And so for me, that's why, like, whatever you think a fair punishment is, I would just basically, like, dial it up just slightly, and, like, that's probably what's going to happen. So if you think a third and a sixth is fair, then it's probably going to be, like, a second and a fifth, right? If you, if you think not getting any penalty at all is fair, then, you know, you're going to get something. So that's probably what we'll sort of see happen. But, you know, it's it's led to some conspiracy theories of, about, you know, did the Falcons know this was coming and that uh, affected how they approached this past year's draft? I know Jarvis Davis expressed that earlier on Monday on the uh, Atlanta sp uh, football party uh, with myself, him and, and Tanisha Batiste. Um, and, 
I just find those conspiracy. Jarvis is not the first person to say these things. I've I've been hearing this stuff since the draft, right? When the when the Falcons zig when they, when everybody thought they would zag in this year's draft, and it's led you know to some of these conspiracy theories. And like to me, I just kind of like I, it's hard for me to buy into that just because like it's it's operating to me on a false premise that the Falcons are playing chess while everybody else is playing checkers when it comes to the draft. And I think you know like they're zigging and zagging is like. Yeah, like it's you know, again, not to say it's a bad thing because I think the Falcons are generally okay at drafting. Uh, but it's just like I don't think there's really any evidence to support that they're ahead of the curve, right? When it comes to positional value, and a, and a great example of this is like their tendency to trade up on day two, right? Versus trading down, where the data tells you that trading down is generally a better strategy than trading up just because teams are not as good at being able to figure out who's good or not in the draft as they think they are. And so getting two swings of the bat means that you're more likely to get a hit than, you know, only getting one swing of the bat. And so, you know, and the Falcons own draft history kind of shows this, right? Like if you look at the, they've traded up or down on each of the four drafts that Terry Fontenot has been in round two, right? Their trade down happened in his first draft where they traded back five spots in round two to get Richie Grant. And they picked up an extra fourth round pick that turned out to be Drew Dolman. And when you you look at their hits on their draft hits on non first round picks, right? You can make the argument that Drew Dolman is the biggest hit that they've had in their four years so far, um, and that's where the data kind of tells you. And so I would say in general, like trading down was a good thing um, because you were able to pick up that extra fourth round pick and, and get a quality starter on day three, where you have struggled to find quality starters uh, throughout your draft history. And you compare that to the trade ups that they've done. You know, trading up for Arnold Ebiketti and trading up for Matthew Bergeron and Ruka Roro. And again, time will tell uh, on some of those selections. But so far, like your ability, you know, we'll talk about Arnold Ebiketti a little bit later in today's episode. But so far, your ability to discern like talent above and, and getting plus value out of those draft picks so far, again, still very early, has not quite lived up to those expectations. And so I bring that up in part due to, hey, I don't think the Falcons are, you know, as that's evidence as the Falcons aren't necessarily operating on a different level from a drafting st- draft strategy standpoint, uh, you know, and also because like if they wind up losing sort of third, fourth round picks, which is what they've been trading away in order to move up in rounds two these last three years. And if they lose picks in, in that range, like maybe that's kind of a good thing, right? Because it's like now all of a sudden, like they'll, will be less willing to trade up in next year's draft. And maybe they'll go back to doing what they did in year one, which is trade back, uh, which, you know, again, I would argue was a good strategy, even if, you know, I think a lot of most people say it was a bad strategy because they lost out on being able to draft Javon Holland o- over Richie Grant. But I would argue that gaining Drew Dahlman kind of balances it out. Again, you, you know, your mileage may vary on that one, but um so far, I, I would say that 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 has worked out better than the opposite strategy of trading up. So it's not to sit here and say that, hey, losing draft picks and being punished for tampering uh, uh, for alleged tampering, I should, I should stress allegedly, right, and, until the punishment comes down. Uh, but it, it doesn't it doesn't seem like anybody outside the state of Georgia seems to expect the Falcons not to get punished for this. So it's just a question of how how severely the punishment is going to be. But it's not to say that losing draft picks is a good thing. But if it does force the Falcons to maybe change their process and their approach to the draft, which is being more willing to trade back next year and in the future than they have been in recent years, then that may be wind up being a good outcome for the Falcons. So, again, not a good thing, but, it, you know, process results like maybe it's not a great process to get there. <laughs> right. Losing draft picks with tampering and whatnot. Uh, that's not a great process. But maybe we get a, a better result in the long run. So we'll see on that. And as I said, uh, if and when we get that news, we'll we'll talk about it on the podcast. But until then, we'll just, you know, cease the speculation and we'll move on and talk more today about, you know, the bets that the Falcons are making. You've heard me make much of this, but, you know, the real bets that the Falcons are making, um, you know, on the defensive side of balls, they're betting on some young guys, but in order for that bet to pay off for them, they need their bet on the offensive side, which is betting on some young players, but probably a, a little bit more proven uh, 
players on that side of the ball really paying off for them. And the big bet that they're making on that ball, side of the ball is on Zach Robinson being a great play caller. And we'll break down that all on today's Locked on Falcons. Game time is making getting NBA Finals tickets faster and easier because game time, you know, the prices go down as we get closer to tip off. And I know many of you are like, you know, I can't afford to buy NBA Finals tickets. That seems like such a hassle to do. But game time is, is doing their best to take the guesswork out of buying tickets, finding ways to save you money like their last minute deals, saving up to 60 percent off when you buy last minute. And, you know, buying last minute for the NBA finals probably is not a great strategy, but you can buy last minute on other things and save elsewhere for all the concerts, comedy, music and theater near you. Their lowest price guarantee means the game time will credit you 110 percent the difference if you can find cheaper tickets. And the flash deals mean that you're going to save even more with exclusive in-app deals on select seats ahead of the game. So take the guesswork out of buying NBA Finals tickets with Game Time by downloading the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL, and you'll get twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On NFL L O C K E D O N N F L for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So, guys, before we continue today's Locked On Falcons, I want to talk about the Locked On Sports Today free 24-7 streaming sports channel providing you, you know, the biggest stories, can't miss analysis, opinions, news, all streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Check it out, as well as the Locked On Sports Atlanta to get more of those local biggest stories on the Falcons, Bulldogs, uh, Hawks, Braves, etc. You know, including getting Jarvis's, you know, conspiracy mongering on on the Atlanta football party. Atlanta football party. It's all part of Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. So uh, the Falcons are essentially making a similar bet to what the Rams were making last year in what many people thought was going to be a re- rebuilding year for them, uh, myself included, where everybody thought, you know coming off the Super Bowl, coming off the injury-ravaged 2022 season, that the Rams would continue to take a step back as they kind of reset things in their post-Super Bowl hangover period. Uh, And they didn't necessarily take the step back. They took a a big step forward, but that step was based heavily off of their offense, right? Uh, That they uh, their success hinged on having one of the better offenses in the NFL and a defense that was just good enough, right, to complement that offense, right? Their success was primarily generated from their offense, right? They were top 10 pretty much across the board. Any number of metrics that you want to look at in terms of to measure an offense, you know, the Rams were top 10 in pretty much like eight out of 10 of those metrics. And then probably like the two that they weren't top 10, they were like 11th or 12th in. Um, But when you look at the defensive side of the ball and look at the various metrics, most of those that you would measure defensive success on, they were somewhere in that 17 to 25 range in most of those. So they were below average defense. And again, it's just... Further evidence of the point you've heard me make a million times on this podcast over the years, which is like team success is driven by, you know, offense, right? Offense wins championships, not defense anymore. That that day is uh, long gone and dead. And, you know, you see that reflected constantly in the league where the vast majority of teams that are top of the league in the top 15 in terms of like, for example, you know, 12 of the 14 playoff teams last year were top 15 in expected points per play on offense last year. And the three that weren't playoff teams, uh, they all had winning records last year. And when you look at the you know, defensive side of the ball, only nine of 14 teams uh, that made the playoffs last year were in top 15 in EPA expected points uh, added per play on defense last year. And two out of the six teams that you know were in that top 15 that didn't make the playoffs, they also had uh, – the, the, only two of those six teams had winning records, right? So clearly you can be a good defense and be a bad team you know, like the Patriots last year winning four games. uh, It's hard to be a bad team when you have a good offense is basically what, you know, the evidence is showing. And as I said, the Falcons are making a very similar bet to what the Rams are making, right? And if you're looking for reasons to be positive and optimistic, which I know we on the Celestials podcast have not been providing all that much on a daily basis for you guys, but like the reason why you're going to be positive and optimistic is because of your belief in this offense being good this year and being one of the better offenses in the NFL. Um, and the reason why you're you're basically fully sold on the six big bets that they're making on that side of the ball in the offense, right? The six big bets are, you know, they've upgraded the quarterback. Their big three trio, you know, bets two through four 
is that their trio of plus skill position players, Bijan, Drake, and, and Kyle, are going to be able to carry the offense each and every week. And you're going to the fifth bet is the offensive line performing like a, a legit top five unit. Um, and I'm I don't know, I'm getting this weird deja vu because I feel like these were also the same bets that the Falcons were making last year. But I don't know. That's just a weird. Yeah, it's just weird. I don't know. I can't shake that feeling. But the sixth bet that the Falcons are really making, and I think the biggest bet of them all, is that Zach Robinson is going to be able to accomplish all these things because those other five bets, I don't know if they reach where the Falcons want them to reach is if Zach Robinson isn't a good play call, right? All those bets to a certain extent, you know, Kirk Cousins' success as quarterback, the big three, you know, defenses are going to know who's getting the ball each and every Sunday. And the goal is that they're going to be pretty much powerless to stop them, similar to going back to the days of, you know, when those big skills players were Michael Turner and Julio Jones and Roddy White and Tony Gonzalez and Calvin Ridley and those guys. It's like defenses knew who was getting the ball, uh, but they still couldn't stop uh, those guys from getting the ball. So it's a similar sort of situation. And you need a play caller that can sort of maximize that, right? That basically, like, yeah, you know what's coming. We, I know what's coming. But you can't stop it because I'm out here, you know, in in you know, got my whiteboard, you know, scribbling plays out and, and, and cooking each and every Sunday. And so that's where the Falcons big bets are making. And, and the Falcons are a playoff team this year, similar to what the Rams were last year and so many other teams around the league. It's going to be because Zach Robinson is, you know, a great play caller right out the gates. And there's absolutely reasons to think uh, and to be optimistic that Zach Robinson can be that guy. Now, on the opposite side of the ball. The Falcons are making like 10 to 12 bets on defense. And we've talked about how like the Falcons have like five proven options on defense that are primarily up the spine of their defense Two at D tackle and Grady Jarrett and David Onyemata, one at linebacker and Kay Nellis, one at safety and Jesse Bezos, kind of the spine of the defense. And then one on the outside in cornerback AJ Terrell. And then basically outside of those five players, like the Falcons are going to have, you know, a whole bunch of young players, a whole bunch of unproven players at another positions or, you know, potentially reclam successful reclamations of veterans like Kevin King and Eddie Goldman. We'll see on those guys ability to come back. Uh, but, you know, the Rams were able to succeed with this sort of strategy last year where they had a few sort of proven options, you know, veteran safety like John Johnson, a veteran corner like Akella Witherspoon, veteran linebacker like Ernest Jones and veteran tackle like Aaron Donald. And then they just kind of were plugging and play with young guys at the other positions. And as I said, like they were a good enough defense. It wasn't a great defense. It was a below average defense uh, pretty much across the board. But again, with a top 10 offense, with a top eight offense, whatever you want to call it like that was good enough to win games. And that's what the Falcons are hoping to repeat that success under Raheem Morris and Jimmy like this year on the defense side of the ball. And you're looking at basically 10 to 12, depending on how you count these guys, you know, guys that they've drafted over the last four years, the Falcons, that is that they're betting on sort of stepping into these roles. And as I've turned before, it's like you're throwing 10 things at the wall and you're hoping, you know, a handful of these things actually stick. And so as I count them, you're looking at three rookies this year, uh, on the defensive line, Ruka Roro, Brandon uh, Dorless, and Braylon Trice as some of those contributors. Three second-year players from last year's draft in Zach Harrison, Clark Phillips, and DeMarco Hellams. Three third-year players in Arnold Ebiketti, Troy Anderson, and D. Alford. And one fourth-year player in Richie Grant. And if, you know, that gets you to 10, right? And if you want to throw in two more, you can throw in D'Angelo Malone. You can throw in, you know, Taquan Graham. You know, some of you, I'm sure, will throw in Nate Landman in that mix. So, you know, that will get you up to 12 to 13 guys that the Falcons are expecting to contribute this year. In addition to the so, sort of those more proven players. And, you know, we'll see in six months, which of those guys are going to stick on that wall that they're throwing at. Right. And, you know, I don't think it's realistic to expect, you know, all 10 to 13 of those uh, bets to, to stick. Uh, but if you can get like three or four of them to pay off, right, that's a great outcome for you. If we're sitting here six months from now being like, yeah, they threw 10 things at the wall and three or four of them stuck um, in terms of being, you know, good starters for this Falcons football team moving forward. You know, that's a good outcome for the Falcons, I think, based off of this. Uh, and sort of what do you do, use to define paying off for you? And again, your mileage may vary. I think one way that you can use it, and maybe not the definitive way, but one way that you look at these guys and say, like, you know, in the case of Richie Grant, who's going into a contract year, him paying off is like, that's a guy who we definitely want to give a second contract to. 
And I think that would be true of many of these other guys when their contracts are are coming up in the next couple of years. Um, and it reminds me of something, uh, you know, last week's episode where I, I broke down whether or not AJ Terrell was going to break the bank uh, for, you know, move, reset the the cornerback market and, and sort of suggested that he probably won't, but he'll still be one of the higher paid corners in the NFL. And I noticed a lot of comments on that video being like, oh, they, they you know, I don't think the Falcons should pay AJ, you know, sort of premium dollars. And I just, again, it's fine. Like your opinion is your opinion. You, you're entitled to it. But I just sit here and I go like, who else are you going to pay? Yeah. <laughs> like, like if you're not going to pay AJ Terrell, like who, who do you guys think is worth paying? Because like, are you going to go out there next off season and as AJ Terrell walks in free agency and be like, let's go pay CJ Henderson or Eric Stokes. And we'll pay those guys like 15, 16, $17 million a year, but we won't pay AJ Terrell $19 million a year. It's like, all right, like that's a choice. Like by all means, make a, make that choice. So like when I see fans being like, no, AJ's not worth the premium dollars. I'm just like, who, who, <laughs> if he's not worth the premium dollars, then what do you think is worth premium dollars? Like clearly no one's worth the premium dollars if he's not worth the premium dollars. But um, it's, it's, you know, it, it is to me, it'll be interesting to sort of see, you know, when we're having the conversation, you know, with Richie Grant next year, AJ Terrell next year, um, you know, again, I don't, I don't think we're going to have that conversation with AJ Terrell. That, that's what they said. Like they'll probably pay him in the next weeks, the months, sometime this summer. Uh, and, you know, I'm looking forward to reading the comments on that one. People were like, oh, they overpaid him. And it was like, who else you paying, guys? <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think you guys understand how free agency works or how any of this stuff works if you're like, don't pay AJ. But anyway, that's that's a separate conversation. But, um, you know, throughout this week, we're going to talk more about some of these 10 to 13 bets in terms of their potential to pay off. And we'll talk about, you know, the breakout potential of many of these guys. And as the week unfolds, like you, you'll probably not hear me express you know high levels of optimism on the potential breakouts but again we're still hoping that one or more of these guys wind up breaking out it's just anyone's guess on who these guys are going to be but we're going to start that conversation with arnold ebiketti because the box scores strongly suggest that he has great breakout potential but the film doesn't quite back that up and we'll break that down as we wrap up today's locked on Falcons. guys it is winner take all time in the nba and nhl uh, due to the finals, Stanley Cup finals, conference or not conference finals, NBA finals, and FanDuel is giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 bucks to bet on spreads, money lines, player props, and so much more. You want to bet on the NBA finals, the NHL finals. You want to bet on Major League Baseball. FanDuel's got you covered. You want to bet on the upcoming NFL season. The Falcons over under win totals of nine and a half, right? You want to bet on how many yards and touchdowns Kirk Cousins is going to throw, how many yards and touchdowns B. John Robinson, Drake London, and Kyle Pitts are going to have this year. It's all available for you at FanDuel.com slash locked on. Also check out the NBA draft props where the Hawks have the number one draft pick. I know many of you have some thoughts on that. So make sure you head on over to FanDuel.com slash locked on and you can make every bet in every playoff shot count. FanDuel is America's number one sports book. So as I said, uh, today we'll be talking about Arnold McKinney's breakout potential. Probably tomorrow we'll talk about Troy Anderson's breakout potential. I think these two guys are the, the two most talented of the groups of these group of, you know, 10 plus players that have, you know, the, the potential to impact. And so therefore I think, you know, as we talked about leading up to the draft, bet on traits, like bet on the traits, bet on the upside uh, in terms of these guys having the greatest potential. And so Troy Anderson may be next on deck, but today we'll wrap up talking about Arnold Abbey Ketty. Um, and he's been, you know, suggested by PFF multiple times this offseason as a breakout candidate for the Falcons. And it's understandable. Like when you look at the fact that Arnold McKinney was as productive as he was in a limited role last year, six sacks, only playing about 34% of the snaps. Like, you know, a lot of people, I think, sort of assume, oh, well, he's going to get Bud Dupree's workload last year, uh, who played about 64% of the snaps. And that's basically doubling his snaps. And so if you double the snaps, then theoretically, if, if sacks are linear, right, and uh, he'll get double digit sacks this year. And again, it doesn't quite work on that sort of linear level. Um, and I think a lot of that is based off of box score scouting because I think you have to look at the film, right? You know, process over results. 
and you know your process is going to be more predictive of future results than past results are going to be and that's why you got to look at the film and so i went back and, and looked at every sack and every quarterback hit that arnold ebikitty had last year uh and while he had six sacks in the, officially you know seven sacks because some of those sacks were half sacks so seven times he dropped the quarterback for a sack and he had 12 quarterback hits so uh, an additional five hits on top of those seven sacks uh and breaking those down going back to the film like i would sort of say of those seven sacks four of them were cleanup sacks two of them were unblocked and one of them where he did win it with a pass rush, going, pass rush move going up against Saints backup right tackle Landon Young in that Week 12 matchup. And then of the five additional hits that he had, three of those came off of stunts. One of those was unblocked, and one of those was a cleanup sack. And again, for those of you not familiar with the term cleanup sack, that's basically where someone else kind of gets the pressure and you sort of finish the play. You get the cleanup um, you know, sack where someone else's pressure. The quarterback holds onto the ball too long. That happened a couple of times in that commander's game with Sam Howell. Uh, or, you know, where the quarterback is escaping the pro- pocket and, you know, you as an athlete are able to once, you know, in the case of Arnold K- Ebiketti running a 4-6, you know, only a handful of quarterbacks in the league are going to be able to run away from him once they try to get outside the pocket and he'll be able to chase those guys down and, and get them on the ground. So, you know, that type of production isn't necessarily conducive to the breakout where you're looking at 12 of these times he's hit the quarterback and the vast majority of it was effort and scheme. And that's a big reason why last year you weren't hearing me throughout the season being like, oh, Arnold Evacetti needs to play more because like I'm watching this on film throughout the season and you know, reconfirming that, revisiting the film today. It's like, yeah, like I wasn't one of these people being like, oh, why isn't Arnold Evacetti playing more? Because it's like, because like he doesn't really, he's not really adding a whole lot as much as I think people think he is just looking at, you know, the box scores and the PFF data thinking that he's like this much better pass rusher than, Bud Dupree or Lorenzo Carter or whoever else the Falcons had out there last year, um, you know, and deserves more playing time. But, you know, Ebiketti's lack of progress last year is part of the reason why I've become a little less enthusiastic about quote unquote technical pass rushers, which is part of the reason why I was lower in layout to Latu this past pre-draft cycle than than other folks were. You know, we talked about this when we drafted it. AK, uh, he was a very technical guy at uh, Penn State, didn't have great power, had good speed, hasn't been able to really utilize that speed to be as effective. And it's c- kind of caused me nowadays to think like power and speed kind of set your floor as a pass rusher and technique is really about your ceiling and that won't really pay off until years down the road. And we haven't really seen that pay off for Arnold Abiketti, you know, the exception or if you're a Bosa, then the technique will pay off immediately in the NFL. But outside of the Bosa is like, it hasn't, it doesn't really pay off for a lot of these guys until several years down the road. And it hasn't quite for Arnold Abiketti. And so will he break out? Maybe. Can he break out? Absolutely. The potential is there, right? My expectation for AK at this point in time, and we'll see if this changes, like part of it, like this time last year, I was much more high on Arnold Abiketti. And then we got the training camp in the preseason. And I was like, by the time we got to the season, I was like, eh, all right. Like he's probably not going to have that breakout year that I thought he was going to have. And again, that may change over the coming months, right? Like we might, I might be sitting here having, you know, reasonable, I guess, or whatever you want to call it. Um, result expectations for AK, which is like six to eight sacks this year, maybe 40, 50 pressures this year. And by the time we get to the end of August and September, I might be higher or lower on that, depending on what we see later this summer. But, you know, I, I think that type of production would put AK firmly at where I thought his eye level would be a couple of years ago when we drafted him, which my com- comparison for him was Harold Landry. Um, and that's kind of what I think Harold Landry is. Now, you know, you look at Harold Landry's box scores and like you see these two double digit sack seasons in 21 and 23, you see a nine sack season in 2019. So you're like, oh, Harold Landry's much better. He's a double digit sack guy. And it's like, well, I mean, part of that is owed to the fact that Harold Landry plays a ton of more snaps, uh, like 90 percent of the snaps in, in Houston. I'm um, sorry, in Tennessee in those years when he's producing at that level. And he also sort of pads his stats a little bit with cleanup sacks um, in those three years where Harold Landry has had in nine or more sacks. In all three of those years, he was kind of the third wheel in the Titans pass rush. In 2019, that was third to Jarrell Casey and and Cameron Wake. In 2021 and 2023, that was third to Jeffrey Simmons and Danico Autry. And again, like that's a that's a solid place for, for Arnold Ebiketti to be. That's a solid place for Harold Landry to be. Um, in those years, Tennessee had kind of had a league average pass rushes, and like I'm hoping that's kind of what AK can be. 
right? Like the top two guys are Grady Jarrett and, and David Onyemata. Then, you know, being the third rusher to those guys is not a bad place to be. And, you know, I said when we drafted AK, I think he has a better chance of being a double digit sack guy than either Vic Beasley or, or Tack McKinley based off of the information I knew then in 2022 compared to what I knew in 2016 and 2017. I still kind of stand by that. Um, so I think the chances that AK can get there are higher, but it's going to be to me more likely, like, I don't know if he's going to be a double digit sack guy based purely off of it. He's just going to go out there and beat quality offensive tackles consistently. It's going to be, he'll beat some of those guys. He'll beat some bad offensive tackles. And then he'll like add like a half dozen or more cleanup sacks. And that's how he's going to get to like 10 or 12 sacks if, if he gets there, but we'll see on that front. I think the good thing about this, uh, whether you are buying or selling Arnold Abiketti's breakout potential is he's going to have a clear runway to prove whatever he is this year that we know it takes the better part of three years for a lot of these young pass rushers to, to have the breakout. The Falcons have clearly cleared the runway for him to be as good as he is capable of being. And we'll find out, you know, over the next six months, how good Arnold Abiketti is capable of being. And that could be a very good pass rusher. That could be a pretty solid pass rusher. Like, He's he's definitely in the solid category, but again, as I've discussed before, like you look at the film, it's like, oh, it's not as impressive as the box scores seem to suggest it is. But we'll see if he can impress a little bit more this upcoming season. We'll talk more about some of these other young defensive players and their breakout potential as the week unfolds. We'll see what the Falcons uh, you know, tampering penalty winds up being if, if Adam Schefter's reports are true. Later this week, that's all in store for you as your first listen here on Locked On Falcons. Uh, for your second listen, make sure you check out uh, Locked On Sports Atlanta, Locked On Sports Today. Make sure you subscribe all of these shows or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts.